If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of no fees. If you're on Xbox and need some gamer score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Z Retro, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last, sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. I do love the taste of cream soda. Sweet success. Anyway, hello my fellow Latter-day Saints, Kenzie Retro, the Mormon Entertainer here, the most inspirational moment in all of Ayrshire here today, back with another edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast, the best place for all your gaming news, rumours, and those points and trophies. We have got an absolutely jam-packed show today, so how on earth I'm going to get through Everything is beyond me. I may need to split this into two parts, which means, which may mean I'm not going to be able to do any sins. I say I'm not going to be able to do any sins for Tom and Jerry tomorrow, regardless, because I'm going to be up in Dundee for the rest of this weekend, and of course I'm going to be paying attention to the Formula One. So on Tuesday, keep a, keep an eye out. I'll be I'll be uh, going through my thoughts on. The Australian Grand Prix first race of the season because the Formula One is back at Oh my word, the intro is so glorious! Uh, I would show, I would show said intro, but I can't exactly do that because of copyright issues. Which then results in my video essentially being blocked right out of the gate. Not now. Okay, sorted. I have no distractions for the rest of The day. Hello there. Anyway, where is the castle? Oh, there you are. There we go. That is wonderbar. Right. So, anyway, so what on earth do we have coming up today? Well, like I say, it's a very jam packed edition of the show. There's a lot that has been um, uh, mentioned over the course of the last week. Um, uh, major game companies teaming up to combat toxicity in the gaming community. I mean, good on them for that. Uh, there were, pl- the, let's say, two major remasters announced last week have been canned. Now, why would that be? So, anyway, and uh, what else do we have? Uh, PUBG and Fortnite are now available on mobile, and PUBG is straight to the top. Which is... Which is interesting, so we'll have that. Uh, we've got God of War officially going gold, meaning it's going to be officially released very, very soon. And not just that, we have got rumours regarding the Modern Warfare 2 remaster. And the, and it's not good for the multiplayer scene, I'll say that much. Uh, what do we want out of the new Xbox, the Xbox 2? They're calling it for some bizarre reason. Uh, all right, what else do we have? Um, Spiral Treasure Trilogy accidentally confirmed by Target on Twitter. Activision just announced it already and put us out of our misery. Uh, Spider-Man for the PlayStation 4 possibly teased for a spring release. Uh, Phil Spencer wants Banjo-Kazooie to be part of the new Smash Bros game coming to the Switch. And talking of the Switch, there is going to be a... There is going to be a Smash Bros tournament at E3 later this year. And oh my goodness me, I... Here we go. Um, 
according to a report, the next Assassin's Creed game is going to take place in Greece, and that's due out in 2019. Sega has teased a new Sonic racing game. That's so be good. And uh, as and in honor of Sea of Thieves coming out earlier this week, it is going to be the it's going to be those high scoring achievements. Uh, it's going to be uh, the high scoring achievements, twenty five G and above for Sea of Thieves. So, here we go. Right, uh, and as always, a good sh big shout out to my good friends over at Boomerang Rentals. Packages start from as little as three ninety nine a month. They sign up today, get a 21 day free trial, three free game rentals. Choose your package, keep the games as long as you like, or keep them forever at a discounted price from the online store. Saves you a lot of money in the long run, and I can testify to this, I have had a lot of savings. Fast approaching a thousand pounds worth of savings since I started using the service around about this time last year. But anyway, boomerangrentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. Oh boy, it's that wonderful jingle and that means only one thing, EA have screwed up. And over the last week, they screwed up big time. So, what screw-ups have they had this week? Well, let's find out, shall we? Let's see. So first off, EA announces overhaul progression system for Star Wars Battlefront 2. Oh boy, let's see how bad this is going to be. Back in November, back in November, controversy overshadowed EA's highly anticipated sequel to their Star Wars shooter just before the release. Yeah, the loot boxes, which nobody asked for, and we never want to see again. It was revealed in the game's multiplayer, players could purchase packs with real money that unlock powerful abilities and perks that could give them a serious advantage over other players, and heroes as well. On top of that, the progression system was so slow and flawed that it almost encouraged players to buy microtransactions so they could put quick could quickly unlock better stuff for their characters. The backlash for, from the public was so serious that it grabbed the attention of various gambling regulators and government officials who began evaluating how microtransactions in video games should be handled going forward. Yeah, if you're gonna have that sort of gambling in the games, then I suggest having at least a Peggy 12 rating, or even a Peggy 16, because you do not have a Star Wars themed casino. These are the exact words from a from a government official in Hawaii. A Star Wars themed casino. EA quickly made it so microtransactions remo were removed from the game and began working on a way to fix the progression system. Simple. Never have loot boxes and never be seen again. After five months, EA has finally overhauled the progression system in Star Wars Battlefront 2. In a new blog post, they outline the changes that will be added on March 21st. Uh, just two days ago, in fact. For starters, the game's star cards, which grant new abilities and perks, will not be available through microtransactions. They will only be accessible through skill points, which are earned exclusively by leveling up specific heroes, ships, and multiplayer classes with XP. So, what you've done is, you've taken out a slow system, and put in an even slower system. You've just taken two, you've put one step forward, two steps back. There we go, that's screw up number one. Why do you hate the gamers, EA? Why do you hate us so much? It's not clear if some star cards will cost more than others. I wouldn't be surprised. But the skill points will only be earned by playing the game and leveling up specific units. Why not use the skill points for leveling up everything? Because if you want to have a faster progression system, skill points to level up everything! EA 
EA has removed the ability to purchase anything outside the cosmetic items with microtransactions. Starting on the 21st, players will only be able to buy things that affect the appearance of their characters instead of things that give you an upper hand in gameplay. That's how the microtransactions should have worked to begin with! That's how Overwatch has been doing so well! Star cards have also been removed from the game's loot boxes, so there's no need to worry about having to gamble for better gear. Good! They never should have been in loot boxes to begin with! Crates can only be earned through login bonuses and completing challenges. Now, the only two items featured in those crates are cosmetic items and credits which you can use to buy other cosmetic items. WHICH DEFEATS THE PURPOSE OF LOOT BOXES TO BEGIN WITH! Ugh! Man, no wonder you suck, EA. If you don't feel like saving your credits, you can buy crystals with real money to buy other cosmetic items, but nothing affects the credits. Oh, gone! The crystals and credits... They essentially defeat the purpose of the loot boxes, which never should have been in here to begin with! Sounds like EA really took the criticisms to heart and didn't learn anything! Potentially saw some actual damage done to their profits. Yeah, three million, three billion dollars worth of stock gone. Over the controversy, it's good to see studios listening to studios and players. <laughs> I don't think so. And hopefully, this signals a bright future for EA going forward. Um, give my phone for a second. Uh, no. They never learn, they never listen, they never care! And then you wonder why I never play games by EA anymore? They ruined Andromeda, they've destroyed any hope of the Battlefront series. Disney, remove the license from EA, please! Star Wars Battlefront 2 is now available on Xbox One, PS4, and PC. And looking around me, and nobody cares! And that's just the tip of the iceberg, ladies and gentlemen. That is just the tip of the iceberg as to how big a screw up EA have become. Uh, ooh. Um. Oh boy, oh boy, oh that, that's gonna be juicy, I'll leave that one till later. Uh, this is EA screw up number two. Dragon Age 4 delayed internally following Bioware re restructuring. That's because EA failed with Andromeda, they, s they ruined Bioware Montreal with Andromeda and have essentially forced them to merge with EA Motive. Congratulations, EA! We'll never get... Congratulations, EA! You have killed the Mass Effect series! Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. About a couple of months ago, sources speaking to Kotaku mentioned Dragon Age 4's development has been completely rebooted in order to implement more live elements and services into the game. PLEASE DO NOT HAVE LOOT BOXES! This alarmed many fans of the franchise who adore the property for its single-player aspects. Now details from the recent GDC 2018 panel featuring the series' former creative director Mike Laidlaw adds a bit more worry to the pile as he revealed the fourth installment in the RPG series had been delayed internally at Bioware due to restructuring, leading many to wonder what it means for the RPG sequel's future. Simple! I'm blaming EA for how badly they handled Andromeda! I am never forgiving you for ruining Mass Effect, EA! You if- Ugh. No wonder I can't trust EA anymore. When the topic of Dragon Age 4 came up during the aforementioned discussion at GDC 2018, Laidlaw touched on his reasons for leaving Bioware, saying he wanted to try, he wanted to try a new challenge, and he knew that staff reassignments would change the date of the game's release, as explained by the former Dragon Age creative director. As I, 
I was going to have a very small skeleton crew. I thought if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go, this is the least disruptive time for me to leave. So I would be stunned if whatever planned I had remained completely unchanged. For those unaware, there's similar, a similar re just restructure occurred within Bioware during the production of Mass Effect Andromeda. Yeah, blaming EA for that one because the studio was not big enough to handle it. With many veterans of the science fiction franchise having been reassigned to work on the development of the forthcoming title anthem. <sighs> Instead, as lots of folks would argue, the replacement of the original team from the Mass Effect Andromeda with the staff of newcomers ultimately led to a disappointing performance of the sci-fi sequel. And you can blame EA for that one, with many speculating if Dragon Age 4 is to suffer the same fate due to the repetition in this business practice of reshuffling development teams. Do EA not learn from past mistakes? To quote Triple H in uh, the build-up to his match against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 32, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and EA cannot get that into their thick skulls! <sighs> While some might be worried about the future of Dragon Age 4, Laidlaw doesn't seem too concerned as he believes that Bioware holds the series lore in high esteem. According to Laidlaw, I don't have any fear that they'll change the world because there's a pretty deep respect for what it's done. Of course, that's not to say he isn't interested in the direction that the franchise is taking. In fact, the former creative director touched on the possibilities of where EA... Well, nope. Of where Dragon Age is headed, saying very likely they want to... They went through a redesign phase. That's pretty normal. I would find it unlikely to be... I would find it unlikely to be a new Star Trek kind of thing. It's more likely that the existing plans will be re-examined in the light of existing leadership. All things considered, we will simply have to wait and see what is in store for Dragon Age 4, as it is yet to even be officially announced. Hopefully, though, current Bioware GM Casey Hudson and everyone involved with the project at the studio will be able to do the series justice with the next entry. Dragon Age 4 is yet to be announced. I have a feeling it's going to be announced at E3 later this year. Do not mess up, EA, please! But you think, you thought those last two were bad? This, oh boy, where to begin with this one? Where to begin with this? EA created an AI that taught itself to play Battlefield. Everyone grab two of each animal and head for the border because EA is now the sign of the apocalypse. We're all going to die. Electronic Arts Search for Extraordinary Experiences uh, or Seed Division, which sounds like an anime. Space Force has created a self-learning AI agent that has managed to teach itself how to play Battlefield 1 multiplayer, and we're never gonna beat it! In this blog post, Magnus Norden from Seed details how his team, inspired by Google's work with old Atari games, wondered how much effort would it take to have a self-learning agent learn to play a modern and more complex first-person AAA game like Battlefield. So they tried to find out. The results are an agent that, while inferior to human players, <laughs> I want <laughs> inferior to human players. Do you think EA are the inferior ones? Because, oh, I give up at this point. Uh, it's pretty proficient at the basic Battlefield gameplay. Mm, yeah, I'll say, I, I, I'll say it's a bit like me in a sense because I, I only I only, I only, I only do the basics and then I just dig it from there. The agent changes behaviour if it's low on health or ammo. And while more complex behaviours like knowing the details of each map are beyond it, <laughs> not exactly very advanced is it EA? At the moment, EA has found that while the human players outperformed the agents, <laughs> no kidding, it wasn't a complete blowout by any stretch. I wonder why! While there's some good stuff on show there, you can also see some of the agents limitations, especially when it comes to thinking ahead. While they're capable of acting immediately in response to threats, when left alone, they will eventually start to spin around to look for something to do. Which is funny now, but these are, but these are self-learning agents. Every time they play, they're getting better. And it's only a matter of time before they start reaching the point where it's tough for a player to determine who is a real player and who is just some AI running around in a uniform. 
The potential for these agents is twofold. Norden not only sees them as a superior replacement for bots, but as useful for but as useful for quality insurance and testing as well. Why didn't we have this system? Why didn't we have this system beforehand? <sighs> oh dear. This is a sign of the apocalypse because it is a sign that the it is a sign that the EA is going to potentially go rogue. To the, it's going to get to the point where it's smart enough to work for itself and not obey the commands of the human of the uh, human population. It's going to go rogue and it's going to it's going to breed. It's going to multiply. It's going to be the apocalypse. It's going to be Terminator 2 Judgment Day all over again, and we're all going to die. Have you not learned from films that create AI that are beyond our capabilities? Have you not learned from those films, EA? They don't even learn from films! They don't learn from games and now they don't learn from films and television. Have they not learned anything? <sighs> That's three major foul-ups that EA have pulled off this week. Ay, 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 ay. And it doesn't get much better because there's more bad news. This is regarding Activision this time. Oh boy, what have you done this time? Call of Duty World War II was probably the best Call of Duty game since Modern Warfare 2. Ever since the release of the original Modern Warfare Remaster, rumors have swirled that Modern Warfare 2 would receive the same treatment. In fact, people expected it after the traversity travesty that was infinite warfare alas the series went back to its roots and released one of the its best installments in recent memory yeah i bet your activision paid you to play say that one because it's the same copy and paste multiplayer that we've had for the last 14 years <sighs> in fact people while we are excited for black ops 4 ha I don't think so because I don't play Call of Duty anymore. I've never forgiven you for the veteran difficulty spike. I have never forgiven you and I never will. We are even more excited at the prospect of a remaster of one of the greatest shooters of all time in Modern Warfare, Warfare 2. It was reportedly receiving a facelift. In fact, it was considered before Call of Duty 4 that didn't and that and didn't receive the it was considered before Call of Duty 4 and didn't receive the treatment. <laughs> now, rumor has it that a multi that a Modern Warfare 2 remaster is coming to fruition, but will only contain the campaign with uh, without any online. What? Only contain the campaign without any online modes? Are you kidding me, Activision? People are just gonna play the campaign, trade it back in. Boom. They're gonna bu they're gonna buy it at midnight. Oh, my brain hurts. They're gonna buy it at midnight, play it, finish the campaign, one hundred percent it possibly, and then that's it. Trade it back in the very next day. And I guarantee you, they're gonna charge at least thirty quid for it. Thirty quid for a campaign that's gonna last at most. 10 hours, if you're really good. <sighs> terrible. Absolutely terrible. Shame on you, Activision. Yeah, is Activision insane? Absolutely! They release the same game every year, and they have done for the last 14 years, and nothing's changed! While Modern Warfare 2 has one of the best campaigns in FPS history, there's no denying that, America being invaded, the country's capital decimated, and considering the tensions with Russia nowadays, one of the playable characters in the game infiltrates a Russian terror cell who shoots up an airport. Oh god, no Russian. Oh, that was... That was horrific, to say the least. Despite how good it may be, people don't call, don't play Call of Duty simply for the single-player campaign. EXACTLY! THEY PLAY IT FOR THE MULTIPLAYER! The multiplayer in Modern Warfare 2 is the best in the series, taking all of the best aspects of the previous Call of Duty titles, which, 
which dwarf everything recently released from the franchise. Yeah, one of my friends, I'm not kidding, they prestige twice in Modern Warfare 2 multiplayer on the PlayStation 3! And combines it all into one. The end result is pure magic. To cut it out of the game is criminal. Exactly! The sad thing is that just when you think Activision is beginning to learn from their mistakes, HAVE THEY NOT LEARNED ANYTHING EITHER?! <sighs> and, a re and released a Call of Duty game for the ages, they made this horrendous blunder. Yes, this is a rumour per se, but in all likelihood it will happen. <laughs> Activision loves to take one step forward and several backwards. <laughs> they don't take any steps forward. They're always living in the past because they're like, Oh, this was, oh, this was so good. Let's keep this. Uh, yeah, next, yeah, next year's game. Yeah, let's just keep the same multiplayer component. Uh, what about the following year? Uh, yeah, let's just keep the same multiplayer component. Do they not change anything apart from the title? The only thing they change is the title. It's, the, it's that, uh, they it's, uh, it takes me back to that, th that thing I, uh, was takes me back to that thing I said, uh, I think it was like a few weeks ago now, that about, regarding the, um, regarding the, the episode where you had, uh, the new Malibu Stacy doll, and it's like, yeah, sure, but, uh, it's got a new hat, that's what Activision is, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's the same game, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, got a different title, so it's technically different, no, it's not, if the gameplay is exactly the same! going to be fine. Everything is going to be fine. Let's talk more positive stuff, shall we? And we have got news regarding the new Super Smash Bros. game. Excellent! Let's see what we have. This is on IGN just earlier today, in fact. Nintendo opens its E3 2018 website. Although we're still a few months away from this year's E3, with conferences beginning June 10th and the expo floor opening up between June 12th and June 14th, that doesn't mean that the big wigs of the gaming industry haven't already started setting their plans in motion, as evidenced by Nintendo's unveiling of its own E3 website. Hmm, good on you, Nintendo. Although the site itself is currently quite bare-boned, that's to be expected given the fact it just launched, uh, opened even, uh, with just a promise that more details will be announced further down the line. The site does feature a reminder about Nintendo's two major tournaments that will be running throughout E3. Now, this is what I was talking about. This is what I mentioned earlier regarding the Super Smash Bros. Invitational. Right, there we go. Uh, I, I may need to do a I think I might need to do a tweak or two. Hang on a second. Ah, much better. Much better. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Right. Uh, let's see. Um, over the past few years, Nintendo has developed a tradition for avoiding the big glitzy press conference favoured by its rivals, opting instead to broadcast its announcements via the spotlight, similar to its regular Nintendo Direct, which is what they've done since 2015, I believe? Yeah, 2015. Yeah. Although it hasn't yet detailed this year's plans, it's probably safe to bet that, that this will once again be the case this year. So it's worth keeping an eye on Nintendo's dedicated E3 site. As always, we'll have we'll have up-to-date coverage here on IGN at our dedicated E3 hub. Expect teases and announcements to start ramping up cl uh, the closer we draw to E3 as well as a steady stream of announcements regarding press conferences and events. We already know that we should be seeing something from CD Projekt Red's long, longer stating cyberpunk, with more announcements sure to follow soon. So yeah, let's have, let's have a look at this, uh, let's have a look at what's happening regarding this. Okay, so this one was just yesterday. So yeah, I talked about this, uh, I mentioned the Super Smash Brothers Invitational. So this is what we've got in store. Nintendo has announced that it will be holding tournaments for both Super Smash Bros. for the Switch and Splatoon 2 during its E3 showcase in Los Angeles happening later this year. The Super Smash Bros. Invitational will be held on between June 11th and 12th in LA and Splatoon 2 World Championships will be held on April 20th. 
on April 21st. Hey, that's just late to this. That's just next month, in fact. Although Nintendo has yet to announce the exact venue for either event, the tournaments will showcase players from around the globe and will be streamed on YouTube and Twitch. Hmm, might watch it. Qualifiers for Splatoon 2 in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia and Japan will begin on April 21st and additional information regarding E3 will be announced at a later date. IGN sat down with Bill Trinan, Senior project, Product Marketing Manager of Nintendo of America to learn a little bit more about how Nintendo plans to select participants for the Super Smash Bros. Invitational and balancing fun with competitive gameplay. We look at the Invitational from both a tournament perspective and a play perspective. We plan on showcasing high level world class play with Super Smash Bros. for the Switch. And we also plan on showcasing the game in a way that highlights how fun it can be for players and different ways that players will enjoy playing the game. I think that's something that's a bit unique to Nintendo's approach to these type of types of tournaments, Trenin told IGN. We try to design in a way that's welcoming to both people who are really into esports, into the esports sides of things, but also to people who maybe don't spend as much time watching esports but are still interested in seeing fun competitive play. Nintendo's history in esports mostly dates back to Super Smash Bros. Melee. Its, in its inclusion at EVO 2013 gave it a second wind of life, transforming it into one of the most popular fighting games in the world, and it's easy to see why. The reality is that Smash Bros already has its own competitive scene, and it's a scene that we've tried to continue to support in a variety of different ways. And we've seen a lot of growth regarding the number of players and viewership. I think those tournaments are really good at focusing at on the competitive scene. Trenin told IGN, for E3 and with our own tournaments, we're trying to look at how we can bring that same competitive fun to a larger audience as we as we start to do some of that, we'll see some of that larger audience bleed back over into the competitive scene and the tournaments it themselves. We asked how Nintendo plans to keep their titles relevant within the competitive gaming community. Trinin stated that it's often a case-by-case -case scenario with each title. It depends on the game. With Splatoon 2, we've had a constant stream of updates coming post-launch. Having a tournament is an opportunity for us to showcase new content that's coming to the game that players are familiar with, but the viewers may not be. Also with Splatoon 2, we've seen that since the Splatoon Invitational E3 last year, more and more teams have begun participating in Splatoon 2 tournaments, so it's just another opportunity to showcase that community and those teams in a way that can help grow that community, Trenin told IGN. Obviously, a Super Smash, obviously Super Smash Bros. is a different beast. It's got a very active community that's supporting multiple iterations of the game, so this is our chance to shine a light on those communities and get people really excited for Smash Bros on the Switch. And apparently Smash Bros for the Switch is coming out later this year in fact, but the question is, is it going to be a brand new game from scratch or is it going to be a port of Super Smash Bros for Wii U and 3DS? If it's going to be from the if it's going to be for the, if it's going to be a port of these Wii U and 3DS game, I think they should have it as the final Smash edition, with the inclusion of the new characters like yeah, Breath of the Wild Zelda, which has been teased, uh, Splatoon, and while we're on the subject of Smash. Well, on the subject of Smash, Xbox Boss is on board for Banjo Kazooie to come to the Switch. Now, let's see what happens. 
There's no doubt that the official announcement of Super Smash Bros. for the Nintendo Switch caused fans of the long-running fighting game franchise to rejoice and immediately begin speculating about the forthcoming title's roster, as the epic reveal trailer only teased some of the characters that will be available at launch. This was all led to lots of folks compiling their own personal wish lists for characters outside of Nintendo-branded releases to appear in the game, with many pinning their hopes on Banjo-Kazooie eventually being a playable character. One fan in particular was so excited by the prospect of Banjo-Kazooie potentially being added to the roster of Super Smash Bros. for the Nintendo Switch that they decided to petition Xbox boss Phil Spencer to see if he would be on board with the Bear and Bird duo, which are now technically Microsoft properties, showing up in the fighting game. <laughs> As seen in the tweet ex Twitter exchange below, was the user known as Banjo, eh, Banjo EXE, asked Spencer if he'd be willing to let Banjo Kazooie appear in Super Smash Bros. for the Switch, which the with with with, with the Xbox boss succulently replying, "Yep, Phil Spencer is on board for Banjo Kazooie to come to the Switch." be so beautiful. While this will surely cause many Banjo-Kazooie fanatics to become elated by the thought of the characters being playable in Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo Switch, it's important to note that this is far from a an official confirmation of their inclusion in the game. After all, Nintendo has yet to openly acknowledge whether or not the forthcoming title is a brand new entry in the series or just a port of the Wii U version. All things considered, it's safe to presume that there's still a long way to go before Super Smash Bros. fans finally learn which characters will be in the Switch title. But should Microsoft be willing to collaborate with Nintendo and allow Banjo-Kazooie to become part of the roster, it's unquestionable that the fighting game will be a must-have purchase for many. Of course, it's arguable that there are plenty of other crossover characters that would stoke the flames of anticipation even more so than Banjo-Kazooie. But for now, it's just fantastic. It's fantastic just to know that more Smash is on the way. Super Smash Bros. is currently scheduled to launch at some point in 2018 for the Nintendo Switch. All aboard the hype train. Wow. How long have I been going for? Ah, 36 minutes and I've managed to cover about half of the stories for today. Um, right, let's see. Tomb Raider remasters announced last week have been canned. It turns out they weren't actually sh sanctioned by Square Enix. Well, the Tomb Raider games that were made for the PS1 and PS2 era, they were technically done by Core Design, not Square Enix. <laughs> I hope you weren't too terribly excited for those Tomb Raider remasters that were announced earlier this month, but because they've been cancelled. The teaser videos are gone, and Realtek VR, the company that was purport purportedly handling purportedly handling the remasters, said in a cryptic tweet that it is now focused on new AR and VR projects. After this episode, we are refocusing on new projects involving augmented reality on iOS and VR on PC. We are not more committed on third-party license anymore. The only follow-up it has provided was in response to a request to release just the HD textures in which it said simply, we can't respond. Sorry. But Square Enix told Games Industry that, that it was responsible for the curl order because the remasters hadn't actually been given the green light in the first place. Makes perfect sense. While we always welcome passion and excitement from the Tomb Raider for the Tomb Raider franchise, the remasters in question were initiated and advertised it without seeking approval. As such, they were never actually sanctioned, it said in a statement. Ensuring fans, receiving, ensuring fans receive high quality gaming experiences is at the heart of our mission as a company, which requires all projects to go through proper channels. 
A real tech VR rep said in an email that it couldn't discuss the specifics of the matter for legal reasons, but added that the studio had a great experience with Square Enix while developing the mobile versions of the first two Tomb Raider games. Hmm. Okay. But our recent research, studies, and reviews on Tomb Raider 3 were unwelcome. Although those rights are protected by with fair dealing in Canadian copyright law, the rep said, right now, we don't have any business with Square Enix anymore. Well, interesting. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong, but... Hey ho, these things happen. Not really much we can do. Ah yes, I've already reported on that. Um, what to go for next? Uh, one more P. Ah, oh, this one. Um, I mean, goodness me, that is horrific. All right, Minecraft, Minecraft players bomb threat closes over four hundred schools. Good grief! What the heck happened? Right, anyway, let's see. Over 400 schools were forced to close temporarily following a series of bomb threats sent via email by a Minecraft player. Police concluded that they are likely that there was likely no viable threat to any of the schools in question, and the schools were given additional security advice following the incident. The threatening emails were staged to look like they were from Velt PVP, a Minecraft server site. Velt PVP. PVP issued a statement following the event stating that it had no involvement in the threats. The email said that a student was sent to a school with a bomb and the sender demanded that $5,000 be sent to payments at veltpvp.com or the bombs would go off. According to Sky News, who supposedly spoke with one of the perpetrators of the hoax, the threats were in retaliation to alleged DDoS attacks committed by Velt PVP against other Minecraft sites. The 17-year-old Velt PVP CEO, Carson Kelly, told Sky News that the DDoS allegations were completely false and took to Twitter to further deny involvement with the emails. We had nothing, as then they said on March 19th, we have nothing to do with the bomb threats that were sent out to 400 plus UK schools. We've been We've been harassed by a group of cyber criminals that are trying to harass us in any way possible. We're extremely sorry for anyone who had to deal with this, but just know it's fake. Felt PvP is a server where Minecraft players compete head to head, where the player base is primarily minors under the age of 18. According to Cali, the server sees approximately 100,000 users per day looking to face off against one another. A threat of this level is certainly uncommon in the gaming community. Usually police involvement is centered around swatting where someone calls in a threat to get the police to raid a specific address. The practice is usually used against streamers who are live at the time. Like Dr. Disrespect, who was the victim of a swatting attack, swatting raid last week. Fortunately, no one was harmed during this incident, but the severity of this act is still alarming. It's disturbing to see what lengths people will go to over a Minecraft feud. Hopefully this was a one-time occurrence and will not happen again in the future. It's highly unlikely it's not going to happen. And talking of toxicity in the video game community, major gaming companies are teaming up to combat toxicity in gaming. 
The Fair Play Alliance joins more than 30 companies, including Blizzard, Riot, and Twitch, to make online gaming a nicer experience. It's no secret that on game, online games like Overwatch, League of Legends, and many others suffer from toxic communities. From raging over suboptimal team compositions or underperforming teammates, to slinging insults steeped in racism, sexism, and homophobia. It's a problem that has plagued gaming pretty much as long as we've been connecting our computers to play and uh, to play with and against each other online. More than now, more than 30 major companies, including Blizzard, Riot, CCP, Twitch, Discord, and Epic, are teaming up to tackle the problem collectively through an organization called the Fair Play Alliance. The hope is that by sharing research, lessons learned, and best practices, the companies will be able to develop a better understanding of why toxicity happens, how to deal with toxic players, and most of all, how to stop toxicity from happening in the first place. Now, this toxicity in the gaming community, it's, it's been a problem for a considerable amount of time, and at least they're actually taking action with this now, and I, I like the way they're going. Many of these companies are not new to tackling toxicity. Riot has established teams in place fighting toxicity in League of Legends as far back as 2013. Good grief! To varying degrees of success, while Blizzard discussed at BlizzCon last year that now that it now has a team in place addressing toxicity across all of its games. With the Fair Play Alliance, those teams are now collaborating with each other too. A lot of these challenges today are super intimidating. Riot Senior, Riot Senior, according to uh, Kimberly Wolf told Kotaku, she is, uh, she's the uh, Riot Senior Technical Designer. These are big cultural shifts as an these are big cultural shifts as an industry and as a society online. We're trying to find our way, having to having to be a company that steps out and says we're gonna be we're gonna be the ones to do this is kind of scary. This is an opportunity for all of us to say, what if we walked together as an industry? I think it's about time we had this happen. What if they walked together as an industry? Exactly. Anyway. Hello. Right, that I'll need to get to. Right, okay. Anyway, uh, Vol and many other designers for the Fair Play from the Fair Play Alliance hosted a day-long summit at GDC this week, mostly sharing insights from the work they've been doing so far. In a series of talks, for example, Blizzard research scientist Natasha Miller discussed Overwatch's player report system and how the incidence of abusive chat went down by 25.4% after instant instituting a system that warned players and suggested they act nicer when they were exhibiting inappropriate behavior. Beyond the GDC summit, plans for the Fair Play Alliance are still unclear. Vol told Kotaku that the organization is still working out how to share resources and set up an easy way for developers to get help dealing with harassment related issues. A long term goal is to create a standard set of rules and expectations that can be enforced across multiple games. But, but getting mass, multiple massive corporations, many of which are competitors, to agree on anything will be quite the challenge. Either way, it's an admirable undertaking that will hopefully lead to some real change. Okay. Now that's interesting that they are, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but anyway.
looks that's that taken care of. Alright, let's see. What do we have now? What do we have? Right, so here we go. So next up we've got news regarding Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. So Player Unknown's Battlegrounds has been a phenomenal success on PC since it's first since it's first launched in early access last year. And it's proving to be quite popular on mobile as well. Shortly after releasing an iOS and on iOS and Android earlier this week, the Battle Royale game is already topping the charts. PUBG Mobile has already reached number one in both Google Play and the App Store, dethroning the mobile version of Fortnite Battle Royale, which was previously sitting at number one on the latter's free apps chart. That's an impressive debut considering the game launched by surprise earlier this week, following a new round of beta tests restricted to Canada. Unlike the mobile version of Fortnite, PUBG Mobile is available to all players with an iOS or Android device, which has undoubtedly played a part in its quick ascent to the top of the charts. Currently, only select iOS users have access to Fortnite, as players have to sign up for a chance to take part in the game's invite-only test. It also helps that PUBG Mobile can be downloaded for free, unlike the PC or Xbox One versions, both of which must be purchased. If you're interested in jumping into PUBG on mobile, iOS users can grab the game here, whilst those with an Android device can download it here. Okay, it's a two links. Um, the game features the same 100 player experience as on PC and Xbox One, and works surprisingly well on mobile. However, if you find yourself, if you find yourself if you find yourself having considerably more success in the mobile version, it's likely because you're playing against bots. Hmm. Interesting. Playing against bots, eh? Still testing it, more than likely, but anyway, here we go. Right, next up, Xbox 2. What we want to see out of a new Xbox. In a short number of years, Microsoft have managed to really turn things around for the, new, for the Xbox platform. After a difficult Xbox One launch, the company's decision to listen to its fans and communicate its plans has been a good one. Now, almost five years after the original Xbox One, Xbox One X consoles are the most reasonably priced they've ever been and selling better than ever as a result. With the, and with the 4K power, that is, with the 4K power play, that is the Xbox One X now on shelves, we can't help but wonder what the future looks like for Xbox. And the recent trend towards iteration, the recent trend towards iteration suggests that Microsoft's next console may not be as large as, a, it may not be as large leap forward as we usually expect from a new console generation. Microsoft's own head of Xbox Games Marketing said in an interview with Engadget in 2016 that for Microsoft, the future is without console generations and that we think of this as a family of devices. Yes, rather than seeing a new console that, that's leaps and bounds better than the last every five or six years, we may have to get used to regular incremental improvements to hardware, which will remain capable of supporting older games to prevent a consumer schism. This doesn't mean that that doesn't mean there aren't new console designs in the work though. Windows Central's Jez Corden recently revealed on his Switch profile that the next Xbox console is already being designed and that work is well underway. To the point where it has where it even has a code game code, code name, although he neglected to share what it is. Hmm. The next Xbox is already being designed. In what he said in Twitter, but that said, work hasn't gone so far 
that we can expect to see the new console any sooner than 2019. According to Corden, two years would be too soon to expect the new console, but it would likely still be backwards compatible with the rest of the Xbox family. Interestingly, this is around the time that analysts are predicting Sony will launch the PlayStation 5. We think, that, we think it's unlikely that Microsoft would let Sony launch a brand new console without answering with its own within a year, perhaps even trying to beat its competitor to the finishing line. This makes sense since Microsoft's first foray into true 4K gaming hasn't only, has only just hit store shelves. That won't, however, stop us from thinking ahead to the next Xbox and what it'll bring. Hmm. I think we'll leave it at that. I mean, okay, fair play. Only got a few more stories left before we get into the points and trophies section. Spider-Man PS4 possibly teased for a spring release. Tin foil hat time, my fellow webheads! This morning, Marvel fans are hyped because they are convinced that Marvel Games Executive Creative Director Bill Roseman is teasing a spring release for Spider-Man on PlayStation 4. Yesterday afternoon, Roseman took to Twitter to celebrate the first day of spring with the following GIF, which, as you can manage, imagine, sent fans into a speculative foam mouthed frenzy. Spring and hashtag Spider-Man is in the air. Ha <laughs> ha, brilliant. Brilliant. We know it we know it sounds like a bit of a stretch, but can't a man just celebrate the dawning of a new and warmer season with a gif an old gif at that <laughs> of the game he's currently working on and excited about. If we're working on if we were work if we were working on Spider Man and wanted and wanting to be cheeky and promote it a bit we probably would have done the same thing. <laughs> In fact, this is the most likely explanation. Occam's razor, Occam's razor be damned though. There may be more to this than meets the eye. If you think about it, a spring release for Spider-Man PS4 would make a lot of sense. The last day of spring falls this year. The last day of spring this year falls on June 21st, the longest day of the year. Which means that in order to fit into a spring release window, it would need to launch on or before that day. On one hand, that would give Insomniac an opportunity to advertise Spider-Man in theatres before showing before showing us of Avengers Infinity War. Mm. Which would be incredible, Martin. Mm. On the other hand, that would mean they would need to reveal the game release they would need to reveal the release date pretty soon. We figured we'd learn the release date during E3, but E3 would be way too late and wouldn't give fans very much time to pre-order. Okay, and if we if we are looking at spring launch for Spider-Man, that would mean a release date. That would mean if we are looking at a spring launch for Spider-Man, that would mean that a release date announcement would need to drop sometime in April, especially if the game is going to be promoted before Infinity War in theatres. It's a bit of a long shot, but we're hoping for a pleasant surprise. And we're not, and we're not the only ones. Greg Miller says, said on Twitter, release date, Bill? Harris Ahmed said, Spider-Man on PS, Spider-Man PS4 is coming in the in this spring, in coming in this spring, in a few weeks, or in the next two months, according to you. Please reply. Please reply must. I'll be waiting. No, and Insomniac Games finished off by saying, no time frame within 2018 has been announced. That last one was a buzzkill. Sorry about that. Keep the hope alive. Ah, dang it, Insomniac! Right. 
The next Assassin's Creed game is to take place in Greece, coming out in 2019. According to a report from Liam Robertson, it looks like Ubisoft is taking the Assassin's Creed series to Greek soil. Robertson's sources state that Ubisoft has planned for the next entry in the popular series to take place in ancient Greece, since Origins was in development. As such, the next currently unnamed entry went into production in 2017. Interesting to note, the game won't be going back to the series annual route. Series annual route. Instead, the game is currently slated to release in late 2019. Current, cu currently confirmed platforms are PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. That means a Nintendo Switch version could be unlikely at the moment. Although, obviously, anything is possible. For even more on the action, blah 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 blah, and that's it. That is it. Sega teases new Sonic racing game. Ooh, goody, this will be fun. As has been rumored for a while, there's a new Sonic racing game in development. Speculation suggests that Sumo Digital, the developer, blah, developer of the excite, the. Blah, developer of the excellent Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed is at the helm. Although this is unlikely to lean on the second nostalgia that previous installments did. A new trailer shows off a bunch of cars before displaying an emblem with an R in the style of the Saturn title, Sonic R. Oh, please, no, please, no. Okay, teaser are good, I'm excited. There's really not a lot to, there's really not a lot else to go on at the moment, other than the fact that this is apparently something new and not a sequel or follow-up to any previous titles. We assume more will be revealed at E3 2018. Now, the final part of the show, and I've been going for how long now? Just over an hour. Well, I might actually cover a fair amount in that uh, short space of time. But nevertheless, it is time for... How am I going to go about this? Anyway, so that's all the news out of the way. Now it's time for Points and Trophies, Trophy Achievement Hunting, Points and Trophies, Trophy Achievement Hunting. <laughs> yep, and this week, in honor of Sea of Thieves being released, it is time to go through the achievements. 60 achievements that bring it to the ever so elusive 1,000 GAMER SCORE! <laughs> right. So, the high scoring achievements, I'm going to go from 25 GAMER SCORE upwards. So here we go. Legends, this is unacceptable! Oh no. <clears throat> Legends, this be unacceptable! Either give a chest away to another crew or have it stolen from you and then cashed in. Ah, blast. 25 gamer score. That be worth 25 gamer score. Gilded merchant, that be worth 30 gamer score. Awarded the commendation for 150,000 gold earned from merchant voyages. Keeper of the glittering horde, that be worth 30 gamer score. Awarded for the commendation of for 100 Awarded the commendation for 150,000 gold earned from Gold Holder Voyages. Mercenary of the Agent Order, that be worth 30 gamer score. Awarded the commendation for 150,000 gold earned for the Order of Souls, from, from Order of Souls Voyages. 
You can always trust the untrustworthy. That'd be worth 30 gamer score. Cash in a stolen, cash in a stolen captain's chest. Become pirate legend. That be worth fifty gamer score. Pretty much that's what it says in the tin. Become pirate legend. Become pirate legend. Holder of the captain's gold. That be worth fifty gamer score. Awarded the commendation for one thousand captain's chests sold. Hmm. You know, hold my grog. That be worth fifty gamer score. Launch yourself from a ship's cannon onto a ship. That sounds fun. Master Hunter of Villainous Skulls. That be worth 50 gamer score. Awarded the commendation. That be worth 50 gamer score. Awarded the commendation for 1,000 Villainous Skulls sold. And Merchant Forager. That be worth 50 gamer score. Awarded the commendation for 1,000 Banana Crates delivered on time. And that covers everything on this week's edition of the Trophy Achievements Podcast. Like I said, no Tom and Jerry Sims tomorrow because I'm going to be up in Dundee this weekend. But rest assured, Easter weekend, I'm going to have a double header. I'm going to have East. I'm going to have Easter Saturday Tom and Jerry Sims. And I'm going to have Sims on an Easter Sunday as well. Yes, I don't normally work on a Sunday, but it's the Easter weekend. I thought, why not treat you guys to a double header? And then from April, and then, and then uh, April, and then the week beginning April 2nd, there's actually, I'm not actually going to be doing anything on my channel that week because that's my birthday week, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm going to be celebrating and relaxing. So, I'll see you guys again, I'll see you guys again uh, on Monday. And we'll take it from there. So, with that in mind, I'll see you guys again very soon. Have a fantastic day. Peace out. Stay faithful.